Hello everyone and welcome to another Left Book Club event. Tonight we'll be discussing our book of the month for March, In and Against the State, discussion notes for socialists by the London Edinburgh Weekend Group. Um, this will be, we will be discussing a very recent edition of it, which I'll go into a bit more detail in a second. We're very excited to have some really inspiring guests under a virtual YouTube roof tonight or this morning, wherever you may be. Um, my name is Elif and I work on the Left Book Club's political education programme. A little bit about the Left Book Club. Uh, we are a subscription book club and not-for-profit initiative. We publish collectible editions of radical books, which are uniquely available to members and posted out each month. We seek to foster a spirit of collect collective learning and political education. We aim to create sp spaces and avenues where people can learn from each other and discuss radical ideas that inform actions and practical steps with the goal of supporting the struggles fighting for us all. Our events in the last couple of years have featured some phenomenal guests and, and discussions. So feel free to check out the YouTube library while you're here tonight. If you would like to become a member of the Left Book Club, please visit leftbookclub.com and click become a member. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. This has never happened before, but if the stream does go choppy, just please stay with us and we'll make sure we're continuing. We continue running as soon as possible. So about tonight's event, 40 years after its first public publication, In and Against the State returns with a new introduction and features an interview with John McDonnell, who we're very happy to have with us today. Uh, the pamphlet was originally published in 1979, and it brought together questions of working class struggle and state power, exploring how revolutionary socialists might reconcile working in the public sector with their radical politics. Informed by autonomous political ideas and practices that were central to the protests of 1968, the book's authors spoke to a generation of activists wrestling with the question of where to pl place their energies. So 40 years have passed, yet the question, questions it posed are still to be, well, potentially still to be answered or still to be pondered upon. As the eclipse of Cor Corbynism and the on onslaught of the global pandemic have demonstrated with brutal clarity, a renewed socialist strategies, strategy is needed more urgently than ever. So this edition has a forward by um, the much beloved John Holloway, and it also includes an introduction by Seth Wheeler and an interview with John McDonnell, who we have both to today here with us today. And we're also joined by Dilar Dirick. So John McDonnell is the MP for Hayes and Harlington since 1997 and served as Shadow Chan Chancellor of the Exchequer from 2015 to 2020. McDonnell served as Chair of the Socialist Campaign Group in Parliament and Labour Representation Committee. And I suppose very relevant to this discussion in 1981, McDonnell was elected to the Greater London Council as member for Hayes and Harlington, and he became the GL GLC's uh, Chair of Finance and Deputy Leader to Ken Livingston. Seth Wheeler is a researcher and activist, co-founder of the Migrant Solidarity Project Channel Rescue and the Workers Journal Notes from Below. He organizes within the World Transform Network. Dilard Dirick was born in Antakya and grew, grew up in Offenbach in Frankfurt, which I, where I think she is right now. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oxford and holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Cambridge. She has written on the Kurdish struggle for a range of publications, including Open Democracy and Raw Magazine. So I think this is going to make for a really, really interesting conversation tonight. And without further ado, I know you're all watching us tonight um, or today um, to hear from our guests. So, John, over to you. Thanks ever so much. Um, let me explain. I'm slightly in the dark. Um, I'm visiting my wife's family in India at the moment, post-COVID. And so I'm, I'm, I'm broadcasting, I think the expression is, from a well on the um, stairway, where's the only way I can get the Wi-Fi reception. If it goes off, I apologize, but that's why it's so dark. Let me just go straight to the discussion. Um, first of all, thanks for the Left Book Club. The work that you do is tremendous in making sure that some of the key texts of the socialist movement over, well, over a lengthy period are now redistributed. So thank you for that. 
Uh, and I'm really pleased you published again the end against the state. Um, the important thing for me, it was never, this isn't about part of a historical archive or anything like that. It is a, a, a document, I think, that raises questions that are as relevant today as they were back in 79, um, 80, uh, when in many ways, I learned from the discussions that were taking place on the, this Edinburgh to London weekend group that was taking place because um, there, there was a special discount scheme on the railway tickets to enable that to happen. Um, let me just ex explain what I saw the original book as being. It was an exploration of how socialists can bring about transformative change. Socialist strategy for revolution, if you like. Um, and it, it wasn't just for the interest of the strategic discussion for the movement overall, but it was a discussion about how we as individuals could participate in that transformative change. Um, and it came out of questioning for each one of us, what role could we play in, cha in changing the world? Um, Seth's introduction, which is brilliant, by the way, I think it's an excellent um, description and analysis of what led up to that moment in 79, 80, that led us to these discussions around in, in against the state strategy. Central to the debate about how we achieve socialist change is obviously a discussion about the role of the state. Um, the historic debate, Seth sets it out very well, I think, in, in his new introduction, the historic debate between uh, Marxist-Leninists, whose objective was capture of the state, dictatorship of the proletariat, as against um, the anarchist view of how we reject the state overall and look at alternative forms of organization based upon thorough democracy, decentralization, the whole principles about power in the hands of individuals coming together freely and voluntarily. And it came also, the timing of this book came after the 68 period in which there was an acceptance of the failure of Marxist-Leninist strategy, particularly with regard to the Soviet Union. But also, let's be clear, there was also the failure assessment of social democracy, gradualist change as well, that, that taking place under Labour governments post Attlee. Unfortunately as well, after 68, it was to a certain extent as well, the failure of the new social movements that developed in, in the 60s period, the 68 period onwards, uh, the autonomous movements into anything that could be described as world changing at that stage. So that led to a discussion about where do we go from here? Um, what role can we play? And so when individual, when In Against the State was published, for many of us, it was really, I think, brought together, it crystallized the discussion that we were having about what role could we play? And at that stage, some of you may remember, there was large numbers of us who then were working inside the state. Um, people were going in as teachers or social workers, um, working as civil servants as well. And the discussion was accepting that the state was a set of institutions, but it was also a relationship of dominance. And by going within the state in those, playing those roles, we could change that relationship. There was also a sort of a hybrid version of that as well, which was you could also play the role as a collective for many of us, which was standing for election, particularly at the local government level, and how we could change the state relationship by being elected to power, but using that electoral process by which we could then hand that power out, and particularly the resources of the local state, back into autonomous movements and into community organisations in particular. And as has been said, uh, in 1981, I was elected to the GRC. And there were a number of us who, in preparing that manifesto for the GRC election, and this was two years after Margaret Thatcher had been elected. Um, it was the first significant election after Thatcher had been elected. So in preparing the manifesto, there were a number of us who were clear of the view about, actually we could go with inside the regional government of London, which was powerful at the time and had large amounts of resources and use it as a vehicle therefore for transforming that state relationship, in particular, making sure that we 
empowered local communities by providing them with the resources that they needed. And to a large extent, um, we did so on the basis of quite a popular program of policy reform, of course. But the more important thing is that we opened up the doors of County Hall and just invited people in. And there was no need to go out and recruit people to say what views you have about the local community, what ideas have you got? We had people flooding into County Hall with their ideas. And every night, literally, the committee rooms at the GRC were full of people debating individual issues, coming up with ideas for policy. So although we were elected on a basic manifesto, that manifesto got created by people themselves whilst we were in position, whilst we were in power. And it was all about the restoration of power to people at the local level. Radical policies, but the most important thing was empowering them, even down to the basics of funding organisations, giving them the resources, making sure every community had a law centre, a women's centre, a trade union centre, a print shop so that they could produce their own materials as well, but also empowering, empowering groups that could monitor our own role. And in that way, we thought we'd be able to develop um, quite a forceful social movement within London itself that could bring about quite radical change and also develop a new generation of cadres because we employed directly a large number of people who came in with the concept of the against the state, but also we employed large numbers of people actually as community organizers within local communities to mobilize and support campaigns as well. And in some instances, supporting campaigns that actually campaigned against some of our own policies. So we were kept on our toes. The result of that was we did become a threat to a risk certainly to the Thatcher government and a threat to the Thatcher government because our campaigning on using state resources came at the same time as the miners' strike. So the Tory government at the time under Thatcher saw the threat of industrial action on a massive scale, local democracy being used against um, monetarism, in other words, the earliest forms of neoliberalism. And so they used the national state powers always to ensure the, the reinforcement of their class control, and that's why they abolished the GLC. After that period, I think the movement itself reverted back to the largely traditional labor movement in particular, reverted back to social democratic practices and a lot of the in, this, in against the state activity that we'd developed um, went into the shade for a period. The next wave, as far as I was concerned, is that the political movement, the moment, the political moment between 2010 and 15, where you had a, a rising up of anti-austerity campaigns, climate camp came to my constituency, incredible transformation of the campaign against the third runway into one, which was a climate change campaign, student protests on a massive scale, and of course then Occupy. Um, what that did, I think it prepared the political moment, which enabled the election of Jeremy Corbyn within the Labour Party, and then the opportunity of developing the in against the state policies and strategy at the national level. But the reality is that I think at that stage, although there were a number of us left over from the GRC period, and a number of people, therefore, we were able to recruit into the new movements, for in from the new movements, particularly climate change, particularly students, etc. There was insufficient clarity, I think, amongst enough of us about what the project was about. And it, we were trying to get across, it wasn't just about electing a Labour government on a radical manifesto, it was about building a movement with a clear view of what sort of society we wanted to create and what socialism actually meant. Um, in the, against the state, of course, transforming the state relationship, transitioning power to the people themselves, democratizing all forms of the state, that we could take control of, and that include elements of public ownership, but again, the development of the exercise of power at the local level as far as we possibly could. But again, um, we were faced, and we have to be realistic about these struggles, we were faced with the full power of not just the, st the state in the hands of the uh, Tory government, but also those elements of the state within our own party trying to undermine us, and of course, the media itself. I think on both those periods of struggle, both in terms of the GRC and in terms of the Corbyn years from 2015 to 2000, 
and 19. I think they were critical periods of struggle where we could learn lessons and develop on. And that's where we need to go from now. In what, and I think that's why the republication of this book with the new introduction by Seth, you can forget about my interview, it's too rambling in the book to be really effective. But in terms of the, the republication of the book, it raises the questions that Seth has put out in his introduction. Uh, and it isn't about looking about past mistakes. Sometimes it is about recognizing the scale of the resources that are needed, um, the tools, the weapons that you have in your hands, recognizing the scale of opposition and the opposition that we had in terms of Germany's position was not just, as I said, from the state or from the Tories. We had a coup a month virtually attempt from within the, our own party. So it is learning those lessons, of course, but Seb, Seth poses a number of questions in the conclusion of his introduction. I think that we, we do need to address. And it is, what form of organizational base do we need to go forward for the future? It clearly is about a much wider discussion of understanding of the concepts that we use, particularly about what socialism are we trying to achieve, but then also, learning from those periods where we've tried to work through the traditional movements, try to develop new social movements, try to combine the two in some hybrid form. What lessons do we learn to learn from that? Seth's argument is that we need to look at those organizational structure. That's the sort of discussion I think that, that we need tonight. But as importantly as well, is how do we build up those resources within progressive movements? How do we develop those cadres? Because my view is this, is that the next wave will come for that political moment where there's the opportunity for radical transformative change towards socialism. And it might come quicker than people appreciate at the moment. We, it appears we're in quite a dark political mo moment at present. However, if you look at what's happening in terms of the buildup of industrial action, the social movement campaignings that's taking on, again, we'll be back into the debate about where do we go from here? What organizational form do we need? And what will be the relationship with the state then and the electoral practices too? So I think they're the sort of issues that we need to debate. And the good thing about it is the republication of this book, I think will help us stimulate that debate. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. That was such an important contribution. Um, I look, yeah, I look forward to some of the questions we uh, might get to ask and uh, further explore. Um, I for sure have a bunch of questions. Um, but without further ado, Seth, over to you. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, just want to reiterate um, uh, that I really appreciate the Left Book Club republishing this. I think it's like a fantastic intervention and a really amazing project. So thank you, Elif, and everyone involved in that. Um, so weirdly enough, John has basically given the presentation I wanted to give. <laughs> so I feel a bit sort of like sidestep. However, maybe um, maybe I'll talk about why I thought it was necessary to write the introduction at that period, and then maybe something more will come to me as I sort of like ramble away. So um, so basically, I, I was made aware very early, sort of like in the early part of the Corbyn moment. But there was also the anniversary of In and Against coming up. It was, about, it was moving towards the 40th anniversary. And at the same time, you began to see um, noticeably a lot of particularly young people come out of the, the more contentious wings of the student movement in 2010, who broadly, you know, you would code with a sort of anti-statist politics, suddenly mobilising all their resources and social capital and networks in support of Jeremy's electoral um, campaign, well, his campaign to become leader of the, the party, sorry. And I was really sort of like struck by that. And I was trying to work out, well, how do we make sense of these young people who ostensibly have two very different political imaginaries at once, i.e., you know, a desire to destroy the state, that's sort a of classical anarchist thing, and then equally a desire to get somebody elected, you know, on a social democratic programme in control of the Labour Party. Now, obviously, you could easily go away and just go, well, you know, they're just making a pragmatic choice. This is just what they've got, you know, you know, and if you were really 
ungenerous, you'd say something like, oh, they've sold out their principles and that sort of mad sectarian stuff that often happens in the left when people make choices that other people can't understand. However, I think actually we can make sense of that through redress to the, the politics of the, of the book itself, of the original authors of the book, which I'll try and get onto. However, like, so I was already aware that this was happening and I was already aware of lots of younger comrades beginning to talk about in and against the state. But when I tried to like pin them down on what they meant by that, it was like pretty fuzzy. So it was either sort of like, well, you know, like the politics of that book or, you know, what happened in the GLC or what's happening maybe now. And actually what I was at pains to do, I suppose, with the book is sort of argue that there are maybe three, not necessarily contradictory, but three very particular forms of in and against politics at play at once. So for the original authors of the book, um, they were they were basically coming out, as John said earlier, they were coming out of sort of revolutionary left that was very critical of the history of sort of Marxist-Leninism uh, and, and the Soviet project. And they were looking for a new form of socialism led from below without sort of like the party structures, without the discipline of that, and also maybe that, you know, could try and aspire to immediately creating the sort of society they wanted immediately in the present rather than waiting for this sort of moment further down the line. Um, and they incorporated quite a lot of the sort of techniques that have been very popular in the Italian left of that period, which was sort of like workers' inquiries and trying to find out amongst your workmates, you know, exactly, um, you know, what strategies could you develop that didn't end up reproducing the very systems that you were like trying to fight. So a lot of these people were working in the sort of like public sector and they recognized that things like the NHS, the dole, um, all these sort of benefits that we, we, we as, a, as a class have like taken from like the social democratic movements of the, of the last century were quantifiable good things, right? They were good things that needed to be defended from being hollowed out or attacked by um, some aspect of the state, but at the same time, they recognised that these very institutions had a role themselves in disciplining and maintaining workers inside capitalism. So, like, well, how can we create a sort of, you know, how can we create new institutions that can't either be captured by the state or capital? And what they wanted to do was like work that out with their fellow workers and with the practitioners. The, sorry, with the people who were like. I don't know, they, they were providing services for the patients or whatever. Um, so that project really poses, I think, the fundamental question of the book, right? Uh, which is like, how do we do this? How do we get out of this double bind? So that's the first sort of in and against thing. Then there's the second in and against wave, which John correctly identifies as really around these projects with like attempts at radical municipalism. And I think the GLC was like relatively exemplary in its attempt to incorporate the social movements, you know, open up the doors of quote unquote the state for participation from like everyday people so they could create their own policy and their own ideas, but also extract resources from the state and hand those over to sort of autonomous groups, many of whom it should be said were also quite antagonistic to the Labour Party at that period. And then you have like this third wave which is, a, you know, what I was trying to wrestle with, i.e. this sort of emerging subjectivity of young, politically minded activists who basically, on paper at least, spoke about the abolition of the state, but absolutely rushed and put all their energy into supporting Jeremy's campaign. And I think if you look at the sort of history of Corbynism, which itself is an incredibly broad, nebulous thing, it was never really as unified, I think, as people imagine, but there were sort of like attempts for people inside that tendency to maybe sort of like grow their influence. Um, so, for example, uh, organisations like the World Transformed, which put on like a big festival every year as a sort of fringe event to the side of uh, Labour Party conference uh, to try and bring the extra parliamentary left into a productive dialogue with people who are involved in the left of the Labour Party. Um, and that itself has you know, like was, I think is a fantastic legacy. In fact, I'm sitting in the TWT office now. So there is residual legacies from that moment. With, I'm in a building that's full of sort of like radical left think tanks, uh, people who are very actively involved in some in helping to create these policy offers from below. 
all this sort of stuff that was incorporated from the sort of seventies model was being sort of like somehow incorporated into this building. Well, I suppose in the final conclusion, I think John's right. I think what we 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 somehow failed um, to cohere uh, a cadre, one of a better word, with very clear comprehensions of what it is that we're fighting for, and also very clear strategy about how we mitigate that. Or, or navigate the Labour Party or even local council, or even the distinctions between extra parliamentary activity and parliamentary activity. I still think that's to play for, even though I think the Labour Party at the moment is incredibly hostile to socialists being in it. Um, and I'd be interested in maybe continuing that conversation as we move forward. That's basically all I can riff at the moment. I hope that was all right. Thank you very much, Seth. I mean, it's yeah, it, there's there's so much and there's so much to be able to discuss when it comes to, I suppose, the philosophy in some ways of in and against the state. But thank you very much for um, for that contribution. And again, it's some some of these things rightly raises even more questions because, you know, the in some ways the governing of an in, in of an entire society is at stake when we are discussing such issues uh, but obviously before we go into hopefully a bit of a discussion um over to you dilar thank you so much Elif and left book club for organizing such an amazing event i'm very honored to share the space today and Congratulations on the republication of the book. It's certainly given me lots of food for thoughts and I look forward to the discussion. So I think there's so many things happening at the world in the world at the moment that require new radical approaches to system change on a global level. So I want to touch on some of the global dimensions of the idea of in and against the state, I think, um, and why we need to develop critical and system critical analyses, I guess, and strategies when it comes to the state because it's one of the most agent if not if not the most powerful agents of world politics today the state is a class issue it's a gender issue it's a race issue it's an ecological issue we cannot not talk about the state when talking about socialism but i think in the 21st century especially as the pandemic has also shown uh, all areas are affected by the state and of course we're dealing with a uh, global climate crisis, there are ongoing wars, and there will be more challenges in this century. So I think we do need a new internationalism that can also uh, take that into consideration and develop relationships, alliances, and coalitions between peoples, oppressed classes, movements that resist the state and state violence, capitalism, colonization, and also, of course, patriarchy, which is the brother of the state uh, on an international level. And I think it's very interesting to see that there are so many social movements in different parts of the world uh, that develop politics that, you know, are interested and invested actively in developing coalitions uh, without the mediation of states or institutions of the world system of states. So I'll share a few perspectives um, and just thoughts I had when, especially when reading the introduction uh, by Seth, um, especially from a feminist perspective, I guess, on the state. And I will also speak to the experiences, the lived experiences of the Kurdish freedom movement a little bit when doing that. I think my main point uh, in the short time we have available is to say that it's really crucial to take any discussion around in and against the state beyond individual state borders or individual states and really look at the global scale because we do live in a world system of states that and the oppression and violence and colonization are incredibly intertwined and um, I think in contexts like the UK or in Western European countries there are legal political infrastructural mechanisms that make it sometimes more okay, I guess, to be optimistic about change within the system and the state in many ways is a vehicle that can, and you point this out very well in the in the book, of course, uh, to provide basic needs like health, education, and there are so many things that people actively want to preserve and democratize also, as you point out, but also the same states are often very much entangled in the perpetuation of wars, war crimes, abuses, and violence against other people in other countries. For example, Kurdish, Yemeni, Palestinian communities have very little reason to put faith in the idea that strategic state interests of the UK may change even if a government does. So I think we need to distinguish also between, um, you know, what can a government do in a limited amount of time and what are strategic state interests that may not change, especially when it comes to foreign policy, because 
this politics of a state do affect people in other parts of the world as well? So that's one question I guess what I would actually like to raise for both of you, well, foreign policy and states. Um, so I think, of course, there is no doubt about the fact that some governments are going to be more positive in the lives of the oppressed than others, but, um, you know, strategic interests may not change. And um, I think feminist movements um, have historically been at the forefront of, of tackling these things in intersectional ways. They have looked at the meaningful, sustainable forms and methods of, of social political change. And it's about changing, I guess, personal relations, the, the, the organization of the world economy, feminism concerns itself with, with so many of these things. And I think perspectives from uh, feminism, in, for example, in Italy, and, and you mentioned this also in the book, that are based on autonomy and dismantling uh, patriarchy, capitalism and uh, state violence together have been very uh, crucial. And I think this really this is so relevant to our discussion today also, because oftentimes in recent years, and this is the case also in the UK, fighting against violence against women is often... Um, expected that the state will play a big role but as we know from the experiences of different groups in the UK feminist activist groups like Sisters Uncut, Women's Strike Assembly and many migrant or women of color led organizations including the Kurdish women's movement structures in the UK is that often the solutions that the state can offer they're carceral they're police heavy they're surveillance based they they uh, they cannot really meaningfully abolish rape culture and patriarchal violence so the one way in which we can think about um, you know feminism's i guess relationship to the state is also about how can it help us to think about how to organize society in a meaningful way in a more generative way that will deeply abolish these systems of violence and not just find technical solutions to it and i think it's very important here to learn also from uh, experiences from the global south in different parts of the world and um, there have been in recent years of course in the context of europe in countries like spain or in greece uh, examples of movement based left liberal waves i guess especially in the 2010s and many radicals in those countries have actually been very disappointed with the outcomes of, of these uh, left governments and this is something that it's a very important struggle memory, I guess, to learn from. Uh, but also in other parts of the world, for example, I guess, whenever thinking about radical politics in and against the state, I think of people like Mariela Franco, who was a political uh, activist and also a politician, and she was assassinated a few years ago in Brazil, and she was targeted for her outspoken work as a politician for the poor, for the oppressed, for women and queers, for the colonized. So in different parts of the world, there are people also doing this similar kind of work, but they are either not seen or we're not learning enough from their experiences, but also because state violence looks very different in different parts of the world. So there's something to keep in mind. And Turkey's prisons in particular are full of such people. So in the kind of perspective of the Kurdish liberation movement, um, and I know I, I don't have enough time to get into the details of this, but ideologically the movement, especially based on the ideas of Abdullah Öcalan, who's imprisoned uh, because of a NATO um, conspiracy actually in the 1990s, uh, the state is seen as a system of, of institutionalized power and violence and that it stands explicitly against the interests of women, of the poor, of the youth and of minorities. So while there are so many uh, kind of aspects of the movement that are organized specifically in this revolutionary non-statist way, uh, so it's a new form of conceptualizing autonomy and self-determination based, of course, also on the experiences of other movements in the world, um, to kind of think about self-determination in a different way, in a non-statist way, there are also, of course, components, especially in the context of Northern Kurdistan and Turkey, that uh, take an approach that is more one that can be called negotiation and struggle. So there is a legal political party, for example, the People's Democratic Party, uh, which is currently in parliament. It's, it's constantly criminalized. Many of its politicians are in prison. Um, and on a municipal level, especially in the last couple of, uh, in the last decade in particular, uh, the politics of working inside these straight state structures, especially at the local uh, governance level, have created new alliances. They have been incredibly 
really powerful for otherwise disenfranchised communities, especially for women, for the Kurdish community, for LGBT uh, groups, but it also contributed to the peace process, of course, but there has also been an immense amount of violence uh, responses from the Erdogan government against these municipalities. They have been seized. They are now besieged. They're no longer run uh, by this elected party. Many of its politicians are in prison. So Turkey's prisons are full of political prisoners who have tried this attempt, but they were not able to put that kind of pressure on the state because Turkey is not a democratic state. So these are some of the differences, of course, uh, when we talk about different contexts. But also I want to just say a few things on on just like ideologically thinking about this question of working in and against the state. I'm currently in Germany and we have a new government here now and the foreign minister claims to build an approach to feminist foreign policy. And one of the first meetings she held was with the foreign minister of Turkey and the coalition very clearly, very strongly affirms its uh, its commitment to Germany's strategic commitment to allies like Turkey. And there's no reason to think that any of the war crimes that the Turkish state has committed, for example, against uh, actual feminists in Kurdistan and Turkey uh, will be challenged by the current government. So it's often also what I want to say in recent years, we have seen this rise of progressive rhetoric uh, because there have been recently many right-wing governments in so many parts of the world, including the US, of course, uh, and the UK and elsewhere in Europe. So now there's this kind of softening of language that sounds leftist, that sounds socialist, but it's actually co-optation of these radical things. And it's actually a slap in the face of um, actual feminists in, in Kurdistan, in the Middle East, to think that these new imperial, neo-colonial policies, these very liberal state feminist ideologies that will continue to sell weapons to um, human rights abusing countries like Saudi Arabia, like Turkey, like Israel, and so on, will, could have any feminist credentials. So I know I'm running out of time, but what I want to say is that it's really important to be clear about, uh, about the ideological impact also of um, what does it mean to work inside a state if that state is implicated in the oppression of peoples or communities in other parts of the world? What are the limits to uh, progressive politics if there are certain state strategic interests that may not actually change even if a government does? And that's why I think really learning from negative experiences, but also from positive, very radical, new revolutionary approaches in different parts of the world uh, will be very pedagogical also for, for different people in different parts of the world. And I think especially feminist politics will increasingly play an important role because really state violence is always also patriarchal violence. And I think just lastly, what I want to say is it's really important to always have an internationalist approach, no matter where one stands uh, when it comes to the state. And there will be a need for new alliances. And it's, of course, possible to use the state in different ways as a tactic to put pressure. This is something that the Kurdish movement also does, although ideologically it opposes the state. But also, I think, and democratize have also... I think one's morality, one's principles, one's ethics should always be closer to an approach that is explicitly against the state. And I think, well, this is what I want to contribute. We can discuss that, of course. But I think from a feminist perspective, but also from an anti-colonial perspective, I guess we want to, if we want to also acknowledge that many social movements, many communities see the state as a colonizing force in the life of society also, uh, that it's important to not just look at the technical things on how to work within and against, but also how to mentally, emotionally, I guess, spiritually, culturally divorce oneself from the state and to render it, uh, many people say, to render oneself ungovernable also as an individual. So I think, yeah, just, I don't know how to put it better, but considering the violence that we experience, ecocide, colonization, capitalism, patriarchy, it's so important to refuse state control over one's body, over one's life, community dreams, horizons, and to make sure that one does not assimilate into status thinking, if that, if that makes any sense, and to do politics that is non-sectarian, that is creative, that can embrace new communities, that can actually empower people at the grassroots level without you know, fetishizing or objectifying them. And yeah, to just have this like strong belief that another world is possible and that is only possible if the state system as we know it uh, can be dismantled in, in one way or another. And I think working and learning across contexts will be the key to that. I'm, I think I went over my time, so I'm, I apologize, but I look forward to, to your comments.
I mean, thank you so much for that, Delilah. That on was, I mean, obviously so much food for thought, but also so important from so many different perspectives, which I think is also often quite under, well, under discussed, but also under, like un, not acknowledged. So I think there was a few questions that you also asked in that. So I'm going to go straight to that. And then um, perhaps John and Seth, when you are also addressing some of these, feel free to ask questions for um, others as well. I think that would be really interesting. And I think there was two really, there's two main ones that I think would be really important to tackle. Of course, this question of foreign policy in the state um, that Delar spoke, spoke about, but also, you know, we speak of in and against the state, but there's context in many parts of the world that um, that that takes form of in some ways like negotiation and struggle with the state. So, yeah, what are your what are your thoughts on that, John? Let's start with you. OK, Della's done us all the great service. She's just brought us back down to earth in discussion of the, the state. We've, all, we've always got to remember that the role of the state in a capitalist society, we keep saying it, is to reinforce the control that the capitalist class has over working people of the working class, full stop. And it will use state violence. We know that, and we've seen that in our own history within the UK, and we're seeing it even now, and we're also seeing it, in, as Dylan has said, in a whole range of, of countries that she's identified. And, and one of the issues there is to remind people that when we talk about in and against the state as a theory, a strategy that we can use, when it comes down to it, we will always have to confront the role of that state in terms of its reinforcement of class power under capitalism and doing it, and it does so with elements of, of violence as well. And I think that's, I think it's been a salutary reminder of, that, of the role. And I just want to, link the issues that she's raised with regard to Kurds and Kurdistan. And I give you this linkage. Um, in my constituency at the moment, in Hayes and Harlington, there are 1,800, 1,800 asylum seekers in local hotels. I also have two detention centres, 800 people who are detained in prison-like conditions. Um, of the 1,800 in the hotels, Interestingly enough, large numbers are obviously from Syria and elsewhere, but there are a large number of Kurds as well, fleeing the oppression from Turkey and elsewhere that Dilla has set out. And what do they get when they meet, when they come from a, they come from a situation where their lives are literally at threat, as well as their abuse of human rights, they get to this country and they have their human rights abused, either being locked up in, locked up in detention or placed in hotels where they live in poverty. Uh, enforced poverty because the refusal to recognize them and to give them any status that will enable them even to earn their own living and now the government has introduced today that many of those people will be sent to Rwanda. It is appalling and what we've got to do in these discussions is always demonstrate the links between the individual struggles that are taking place globally on these sorts of issues but the role that the British state plays in particular going back from its colonial years in particular with regard to the imperial role that's played in slavery, et cetera. But now the day-to-day -day activities of this state, and that's why being in and against the state, we have to emphasize the against element against the state role that the UK government is playing in itself. The second thing is Dilla raised the, the question about, it's important that we develop our ideas um, on a global and international scale. One of the ways that we were trying to do that and in, it was 2018 that we convened, um, well, we'd done it before smaller groups, but in 2018, we, div we brought together a range of social movements across the globe. We focused on the global south and we invited representatives of a whole range of different social movements to see whether or not we could work for the next 18 months to plan a new world social forum where we brought those social movements together and tried to discuss then exactly both what in against the state meant for individual individual struggles and campaigns, but also what levels of solidarity could be displayed by the 
development of ideas that people were progressing in their own individual struggles nationally, but then also what globally we could campaign for as well. And a number of things were fairly obvious that would come from the Global South in terms of straightforward demands, the recognition of the role of the British state in particular globally, the recognition of the British finance system, the City of London in particular, the demands for de another debt jubilee, but more importantly, social movement campaigns to reform, if not abolish, some of the global institutions that were dominating the IMF, the World Bank, and then reform of the UN and its strategies. So there's, I think, one, I think Dillis made it absolutely clear for us, is in all of these discussions, they've got to be inclusive of social movements across the globe. And again, the world social forums that have taken place have been relatively successful in bringing people together and generating new ideas and stimulating the sort of intellectual debate, but more importantly, the, the solidarity global movements that are taking place as well. And we're, and we're seeing that on issues from climate change right the way across to the um, impact of debt poverty that's been inflicted upon the global south in particular. So I think they're the sort of opportunities that we've got. Thank you very much for that, John. Um, yeah, Seth? Yeah, um, yeah, thanks for the questions. They've bumped those with me, but I'll have a go. Um, yeah, I, I suppose that trying to think through, like, how can we begin to create an effective sort of like anti-statist politics in the UK, right? You know, it, obviously, like, I think, I, I, I totally agree that the project needs to be international, has to be an internationalist project. But I think we, you know, we also have to recognise that, you know, there's been a, a history of sort of like uneven capitalist development, neo-colonialism, colonialism, which presents sort of very different and unique opportunities to different social movements and different social forces, different spaces. I mean, obviously, one of the most inspiring things around the Kurdish struggle has been this sort of like capacity for uh, to, to create the mechanisms through which you can socially reproduce your life through these really sort of like collective frameworks of decision making, but collectivizing farms and land and whatever. I think we're very, very far from that position in the UK, unfortunately. You know, like I, I think it's not to say that that couldn't happen here, but I think, you know, you know, the, the working class are really divorced from my land. We don't have access to land. Like, I don't know, it, it would be a very different if social revolution, I think, just on the base of our history and our composition. However, like, I think you're absolutely correct to like pinpoint the lessons that we can learn from those movements. And I'm thinking particularly the movements in Kurdistan and the movements in Mexico, the Zapatistas, who have, uh, you know, very similar, if, if somewhat different projects but move beyond sort of like classical, classical national liberation discourse uh, and move more towards sort of federating regional forms of autonomy. Um, and also I think the relationship between that negotiation and struggle model with quote unquote the, the legally representative parties and then like the social movements is a very interesting one. Um, how, how we can produce that in the UK is like the million dollar question because unfortunately the unions Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your critique, the unions in the UK are tied to the Labour Party, which means that workers' autonomy goes against the, the, the union leaderships. They can sometimes end up supporting maybe policy that's hostile to workers' interests at different periods of struggle. So I think there's a lot. What I'm saying is like I, I totally agree with everything you suggested. <laughs> and I and I think that basically if an in and against politics is to actually develop internationally we're going to have to pay really careful and close attention to the lessons of the, these movements, which are obviously like led the way in forms of like creating forms of like unlived actual autonomy. But equally, I think those methods and those methodologies cannot be transplanted back into necessarily wholesale back into a post-industrial society like Britain, unfortunately. Would you like to come back on that, Dilar? Or um, I think I, I really appreciate the the, the comments and, and responses, and I think that we, it, we obviously we don't have a solution, but I think just understanding that the local context will matter, 
also in any kind of analysis. I think also, for example, I personally know that many revolutionaries in Kurdistan, for example, actively want to learn from the social movements and struggle histories and memories from, uh, from social movements historically also in different parts of uh, the global north. I mean, there have been so many powerful solidarity movements, anti-war movements, trade union movements, and all sorts of campaigns that um, you know, solidarity against apartheid and, and things like that, that have been amazing models for coalition building. And I think uh, learning not just from ac across context, but also from each other's history, um, you know, while acknowledging that developments have not been the same, uh, will be very powerful. And I think uh, what I wanted to say in my last point is also, it's not just about the foreign policy aspect is also about, um, you know, I think, so sorry, I'm, I'll just rephrase what I'm trying to say. I think social movements today, especially those that have been working around issues like climate justice or against femicide and things like that, things that matter on a planetary level, I guess, you know, that don't just concern individual countries or regions that, you know, are problems everywhere in the world or just generally, I guess, war and prospects of, uh, you know, new world wars in the future are incredibly scary. And I think this is why it's important to foster or like to create a discourse, you know, even at such events where we generate hope in the idea that things can change. So surrendering our horizons to statist frameworks, I guess, to the languages of the state, to methods of the state, and putting all the energy, and this is something that unfortunately I can say from what I have seen has happened in many places in the UK, as well as in Turkey, the HDP have experienced different but similar backlash to what happened to um, the Corbynist movement in the, uh, I guess, moment in the UK is when you put so much energy in uh, elections or electoral cycles and develop a politics according to that kind of timeline. And um, sometimes this happens at the expense of more longer term strategic organizing that needs to happen. And that includes political education, that includes um, you know, doing what actually in the 20th century socialists used to do uh, is to actually do mass organization of the oppressed of the working classes. I think now these recent movements, whether it's the Labour Party under Coburn, whether it's the HDP in Turkey, Kurdistan, whether it's Syriza, Podemos, I'm not comparing them, but what happened is that sometimes in some ways they spoke to uh, specific constituencies and they did not do enough work to empower uh, the ones that suffer the most from state violence, from capitalism, from austerity measures, which are the poor, uh, which are the racialized, the mi migrants, people who don't vote, who cannot vote, who are, you know, whose status is uh, uh, difficult. And, um, you know, so, so I think this is why we need to also find ways in which we can combine political tactics and political strategy in more sustainable ways. And this is again, something that people can learn from, from positive and negative uh, experiences in different parts of the world. And that's why I wanted to say that on the last point to really create an environment in which we believe that we can actually abolish rape culture, patriarchy, that this not, should not just be a dream of feminists, that everybody, for example, when when resisting state violence also feel they should resist patriarchy, for example, to like to not divorce these issues from each other. So I guess, you know, the future of, of our struggles will look very colorful, very interesting, especially with input from younger generations that have also grown up in the age of internet where they just find out more about what's happening in different parts of the world. So we need to get rid of some of the old school models, I guess, that are a bit more elitist and exclusive and really find a new language that can appeal to, to mass movements in a different way. And not just in these temporary, short-lived, negative coalition-based moments around electoral cycles, but really strategic political education and organizing. So I really appreciate the comments that, that, that you gave. And I really respect the work that both of you have done for so many decades in such a difficult context like the UK. Sometimes it's difficult, even more difficult than in other parts of the world where there's more state violence, I guess, in the crude form. 
because it seems so powerful, the system that one is up against in a place like the UK. Thank you very much for that, Dilara. I mean, I think there's so much to say, and I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask uh, John and Seth to come back on some stuff. But what I wanted to bring into the, I guess, into the mix as well is often when the dis- when there is a discussion of in and against the state, and I mean often, not all the time. You know, it is it is often based on a materialist understanding. So you know, it's about resources and it's about and it's about services and so on, which are of course very crucial, but in some ways to also remember our late and incredible friend David Graeber, who, you know, really w- one of the things that he was really interested in was bringing the idea of, well, I mean, Dilar spoke about it as well, hope as well, but but care. And he's, and, you know, he would, he would discuss at length. And I know John with you as well, um, there was, he, there was a lot of, he, he understood the, the importance of uh, material and a materialist understanding, but for him, it wasn't enough and there had to be care and what do we do? And I think when we speak about political education and how we break out of perhaps electoral cycles, if we also have to break beyond the material as well, perhaps to maintain that. And I know that sounds more like a comment than a question, but I would like you to, well, all to come back on that. Seth, should we have you first? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's primary, right? I mean, the question, I mean, a question the book poses, even the original text of the book, is like, you know, it, it's a recognition that, you know, like to paraphrase Marx or something, you know, like we don't make history in conditions of our own choosing, right? You know, we're not all in some sort of amazing space where we can control territory and reproduce di- distribution lines and, you know, like turn production into collective play or whatever. However, we, you know, I do think there is a serious proposition that's posed not only by movements, contemporary movements in the global south, but also like in the book itself and also like in the history of the communist movement. So this is an old argument. It's as old as the communist movement itself even predates it. Like, like how do we build, um, you know, like uh, our own capacity to reproduce our lives uh, in the shadow of a state that basically facilitates with capital everything that we need but uses these disciplinary logics to do it and how do we like wrestle that back or how do we create new forms of activity that can't become capital of the state right and that is the that, that's the million dollar question we like we've been wrestling with it for over 200 years right we're probably i hope we can solve it sooner but like you know before time runs out maybe climate change will solve this problem for us um but I think like we have, you know, like we've got a very serious international conversation to have, and we have the serious groundwork of organizing a tendency in, in the in the UK at least that can be coordinated, share similar sort of like comprehensions and begin to mobilize a sort of program. We're, we're basically talking about a transition. Now, obviously, historically, there's been arguments around like transitional models to quote unquote socialism or communism, particularly critiques of sort of like Marxist Leninist political economy, where depending on your critique, it's either, you know, it's only ever reached dysfunctional state capitalism, or, you know, it's just basically maintained workers in their traditional role and it hasn't developed socialism, blah, blah, blah. I mean, as much as I may broadly agree with those coordinates, at the end of the day, like we we still don't have anything else yet to bring into fruition. We, We need to create the space to have these dialogues and it means that we've got to be clear with each other about what we mean by socialism, how we think we can transition, and how those, that's going to be very different in very different global contexts. I don't know. I mean, I hope that made that some sense. <laughs> yes, it certainly did. It did. But I think what I want, I think what I want to say is we shouldn't think that because we shouldn't categorize people into their different roles um, and that's all that they do. So in other words, you know, you're a Labour politician, so all you're interested in electoral politics. No, that's not true. And quite the reverse, the electoral politics, uh, the vote and the election is just the end of the long process of building people's ideas and confidence and support and engagement. And it's one element of it. And it's actually not the most significant element of it at the end of the day. 
That's the first thing I want to say. And the second thing, do not underestimate people's creativity. It is just staggering what people come up with and just brilliant ideas and connections that are made. And just take the trade union movement at the moment. We've got new unionism in this country. All of a sudden you've got IWG being on the, all these small unions we've been working with, helping to create over the last decade. They're buzzing. And we've got industrial action taking place right the way across the country. We've got the left of one position, a majority position on unison by own union, double the strike pay, encouraging industrial action division, uh, fighting divisions against the bureaucracy and all that. And it is buzzing, but it is working class creativity that's creating that, that, those opportunities. Third point I make on all of this as well is that actually it is global. I give, I give the example of we had a delegation of women from Mozambique who said, look, we've not been able to cope with climate change and the flooding that's taking place. And one of the reasons we haven't is because our government did a deal, a private deal in the city of London um, that has never been exposed properly. And we are now bankrupt as a result of that. So what we did is we launched a campaign around that. It actually became Labour Party policy for the manifesto about how we tackle those sorts of issues. And I just thought this is a brilliant idea these women have come up with that we can take further in international solidarity. We're doing the same on pharmaceuticals. Big pharma, as a result of COVID, we're now, you know, Nick Deere and others are launching those campaigns against the big pharmaceutical companies and how they should be under democratic control. And that's a global campaign. So it's absolutely buzzing that level of creativity. And the final point I'll make is this. This is life enhancing. This is absolutely life enlivening. I just, you, you have to go into it. And the most important thing is you go into it with a determined smile on your face, no matter what's thrown against you. And that's what I think is so interesting at the moment is despite all the electoral knockbacks that we've had in this piece of bid, in this country in particular, people have got over that very, very quickly. And young people in particular now are just regenerating themselves into social movements. The struggle will go on within the Labour Party, so they're in a really difficult period at the moment. But once we will engage in all these different campaigns that are taking place, new social movements being established, eventually that will need an element of a link with electoral politics. And we've got to make sure there's an element within the Labour Party that is, enables that to be conducively, conducively welcome. The only final point I'll make is... The, the one thing I thought wasn't really successful in this recent period, whereas in the GLC period and in the 60s period, was actually the cultural struggle was much more effective. And we need to think why that didn't happen. Um, it did happen on some scale, but not in a way that I thought was going to uh, be on. I always thought the cultural struggle was on the crest of the wave, and it didn't seem to this time. And I think we need to think that one through about how we encourage creativity. The most important thing is to stop being so bloody dour and just get stuck into it with a smile on your face. On those picket lines I'm on at the moment, I tell you, I was on the picket line of UCU at the Royal, um, the, the College of Arts. I've never, you know, I've never danced so effectively in my life to the rhythms that they produced. Thank you so much, John. That's such a great note to conclude that part. Um, yeah, Dylan, would you like to come back on any of that? Perhaps especially on some of the ideas of care? Yeah, I'll just, I, I mean, I really loved, uh, especially John's last point about, you know, keeping up the struggle while, you know, fighting and smiling um, or fighting and dancing. Uh, the Kurdish movement is quite, uh, has this reputation of dancing uh, on every occasion. And I think this is something that, is so important really because when doing radical politics uh when you when you do politics no matter where you are what site it is whether it's parliament whether it's uh, the university whether it's the workplace whether it's the street your own home uh the prison it has to be something that relates to life itself it cannot just be a dry kind of dogmatic approach it has to understand that society is alive it's dynamic there are so many uh, I mean individuals make up society the relations between them do so that's why joy and care and looking after each other uh, really just enjoying the process of liberation is so important for any kind of revolutionary politics and I think I see this also for I mean I work at the University of Oxford which is 
an institution that is deeply, deeply entangled for <laughs> centuries now in the history of British Empire, of British uh, wars, of uh, arms production, of detention uh, centers, and like the knowledge that is produced at that university, the investments that go into it, um, or the investments of the university itself in the border industry, in the war industry. Uh, there are so many students and staff members that have huge moral objections to this. And so it's such a complex place to be in. I mean, we didn't have the mandate for the UCU strikes um, at Oxford, unfortunately. Of course, everybody was in solidarity with, um, with colleagues and, and students in other places. But what's very interesting here is that we see that the, the worker of today uh, is not the traditional worker that, and I, I remember reading this also something similar in, in the book, uh, in and against the state that work looks different today, precarity looks different today. It doesn't mean that uh, all work uh, is valued in the same way or that people suffer the same way from different conditions, but but things are changing, they are shifting and the marketization of higher education in the UK is a massive problem. It's a source of huge uh, hopelessness and despair and mental health issues among younger people, anxiety about the future is something that is very real. It actually kills young people. Children are committing suicide because they don't have hope in the future. And this is, this is something very serious. That's why I think um, it will be very interesting to see how we can, you know, develop a language of vocabulary that is really generative, that takes in all of these things together and really creates a community, a culture of solidarity and hope, so that we don't rely on the state's kind of disciplining and monopolizing ideas about how, for example, the UK, uh, what British values are, what the British nation is, because these are, this is the language that leads to all of the migrants drowning in the English Channel, in the you know, EU's border uh, policies and so on. So, so we need to resist this politics of death. And I think um, feminist politics or just any kind of politics coming from the bottom up, uh, from, from the oppressed working classes from from people at the margin are going to be really the new revolutionary subjects also of, of the of this new kind of but alliance building coalition building inside society but also broad and across context and issues is going to be the key so i just wanted to just express one more time my really deep respect for this book because i think this is going to be such an important uh, resource for learning also for younger generations who may not have the struggle memory uh, of resistance inside the uk so yeah i appreciate that very much so yeah that's what i wanted to say on that issue thank you very much for that Dilar. um before we start wrapping up is there anything else that any of you would want to ask and the other or any other comments the last the last question will be kind of like looking towards the future so if you have anything to say about that save it for that part but do you have anything else that you would like to say You mentioned David Graeber, and I, and I really miss him. Tragic that we, that we lost him. Um, the interesting thing I thought about the issue of care was that when COVID first hit us, what was interesting through that COVID period was the reliance, even under a Tory regime, upon the state into, at every level, whether it was the NHS, the local councils, etc. That's the first thing. Secondly, I think one of the things we, we learned of it is that increasingly, not only did we care for each other, we actually needed each other as well. And what was really impressive and still is in this continuing period of COVID and austerity is the scale of mutual aid that's taken place in all of our communities, whether it's food banks, whether it's people looking after each other during COVID and all the rest. And again, it, it demonstrated that actually the combination of those good people working within the state who were trying to ensure that they were harnessing the state to assist their communities and work within the communities, link up that mutual aid sort of was developing a model, I think, for the future that we'll most probably need to depend upon as we go through this cost of living crisis, as they call it, and people get impoverished even further. And I think that will also 
a, a wave of in, uh, various social movement and industrial struggles as well. So part of the discussion I think we do need to have in all of that work is how do we move the argument on now to the next stage of people's engagement in, first of all, understanding that this is in this, these crises are inherent within the capitalist system itself. They will cut they'll, they will affect everyone so deeply and could increase and enhance the grotesque levels of hardship and inequality. But then how do we then lead the discussion on to what sort of change could be achieved and how it can be achieved? And I just return to the point, I do think, I do think there's a real period of challenge and opportunity for the left and progressives in this coming period that we need to wake up to. But we'll come on to that in a minute, as you say, the final question. Thank you very much for that, John. I think it was a really important point to bring in um, to this exploration. I mean, this conversation, of course, could go on for hours or days or weeks, maybe years. <laughs> um, and I think it's been really important. It's, it's for me personally as well, it's been an important, I suppose, reminder as well. And I'm sure that's what it will be for a lot of people. Um, we've had some comments on the YouTube saying, um, I wish I had this in the 80s when, uh, or, as in, I wish I knew about this work um, much sooner and hopefully it will be of use as um, Dilara also said to the younger generation uh, but I suppose also this crucially needed um, intergenerational um, work as well uh, as we move forward so on that note um, you know of course we've we've been talking about uh, the idea of in and against the state and what that would look like and um, you know foreign policy and care and you know Seth also touched on very briefly the relationship to land and so on I think obviously again one could answer this in for you know if for hours but going forward what what to do like what is to be done I suppose is the question and I know that's a big question but let's let's try and have that in a bit of a nutshell as we close um Shall we, I think, let's start with Dilar and then we'll go to you, Seth, and then John, let's have you um, at the end to wrap up. I, I was hoping to be somewhere in the middle because I need to think about this very, very big question. So I can promise a very, um, very solid answer. But I think I also don't want to repeat what we have already said. Um, I think creativity will be key, as, as the others have also mentioned. Uh, you know, there are certain old traditions, old practices that should be revived. And I think, you know, mass organizing, cultural uh, issues, these are all things that I think we need to bring back to the table. And I think this is actually something again, also when talking about state and state violence, is actually one thing that the Kurdish freedom movement, I think, is doing a great job in inside Europe. Um, I mean, there are issues in the UK because the UK is quite London centric, but also in Germany and in other countries, there is a confederal system of the Kurdish freedom movement through people's assemblies and women's assemblies that are quite mass based. So for example, it's not difficult at all for the Kurdish movement at any point to call demonstrations across cities in Europe. And this is a huge, uh, you know, it's a product of decades of organizing intergenerationally entire family, families of migrants, of mostly working class migrants. So they're entire movements that have mass bases, but often they don't get the same visibility than let's say quite short-lived uh, and quite well-resourced, um, let's say activist groups uh, that focus on contemporary issues. So I think uh, mass organizing uh, among the, you know, the poor, among the migrants, among people who, uh, who have, you know, cultures also of community that are often less visible is very important. And I think here I want to just mention the importance also of resisting criminalization uh, because in the, uh, beginning, like when I gave my first input, I, I just very superficially mentioned this, but there is 
there's a danger that I see, especially when, you know, I gave it mainly through the example of feminism, what happens when we kind of advocate or fall into the traps of these system feminisms, I guess, as opposed to anti-system feminisms, or this can be applied to any struggle, is that, you know, these more liberal, let's say middle class based NGO like um, theories of change often find resonance in the mainstream. And that's often a good thing. You know, we want to talk about climate change in very mainstream spaces. Of course, we have to, we don't have another luxury, but this shouldn't happen at the expense of more radical approaches and, uh, you know, more system critical approaches and, and activist groups or tactics and strategies that are seen as, let's say, less um, nice by <laughs> bourgeois standards, I guess. So, um, so I think this is something that we need to actively resist, especially the kind of surveillance and police brutality, the kind of uh, weaponization of legal status that communities like the Kurdish community face, you know, their regular deportations for of political activists uh, in countries like the UK, in Germany, is, uh, maybe not so much the UK, but it's mostly Germany, France, other countries, but also the Kurdish community in the UK is heavily criminalized. And this is a big issue because this is a way in which, again, the UK or any other European state can evade its own uh, responsibility in the complicity of war crimes and human rights abuses in other parts of the world. So I think, you know, there's just these different fronts that we need to tackle together. I think what I want to say here is that uh, respecting, you know, radical system critical approaches, making sure we don't marginalize certain perspectives because they don't seem to be fitting with common dominant mainstreams and really like, you know, the smearing campaigns or that are experienced, you know, in the Labour Party, this is the case, as you have mentioned in other sites. So I think, you know, I, I sorry, I kind of lost my point because the criminalization of the communities uh, that are doing very important work is a huge problem and this is when we say against the state usually it's the anarchists the far left uh the anti-fascists uh you know people with more militant approaches to radical system change that are often the first ones and this is also unfortunately the case in the history of socialism they're often the first ones to be sacked and i think we need to have very strong solid alliances and be non-sectarian in our approaches no matter where we are even if we disagree on certain things even this applies also to feminism we need to really be much more open and much more open to dialogue much more open to learning because the enemies that we're up against are way way bigger than any differences on the left could be So I've been waiting for years to have some sort of megalomaniacal rant about what I think should happen in the future. But I'll, I'll try to rail my ego back in. Although I'm probably going to say something that's like uh, relatively unpopular with quote unquote autonomists. So I actually think there is, an, I, I totally agree with everything that's just been said. I think there is a massive necessity to be involved in mass working class organisation. And I mean that in, in you know, the working class and all its diversity and various combinations, and whatever. But I also think there's a necessity for a party or a party form. And I, try, I suppose that's because, like, you know, I, I come from the tradition of sort of like, you know, like workers autonomy. And those theories and those comprehensions of like how the world changed and whatever were written at a period in, you know, like especially the theoretical innovations came out of a period where the working class in Italy had shared mass sites of production and also shared, you know, their technical makeup where they lived socially as well. They, they all shared the same forms of municipal housing. So if you wanted to take a quote unquote autonomous action against the party or against the party's trade unions, it had the possibility of viralizing and moving among the class because the class itself shared these conditions these conditions of work and these conditions of life. I think the contemporary working class uh, and, you know, in its class composition and makeup in the UK is incredibly diverse, not only like in its sort of like ethnic makeup or like, but also like in terms of like the sort of work that different people do or whether people rent or whether people have mortgages or all these sort of like things. And so actually I think it's not that workers' autonomy has gone away. As John said earlier, there's working there's workers' autonomy happening all the time. That could be like the E15 mums occupying their estate. It could be like delivery workers and migrant workers getting organised and like creating base unions. The problem is like you can't 
generalize those tactics to the whole of your class in the way that you might want to be able to. And actually, I think, therefore, what we need is a party to aggregate these different forms of autonomy into something that's reasonably politically coherent and can begin to advocate collectively. But how we do that without like incorporating these struggles and then just like, you know, the classic thing of recuperation where you just like adopt a struggle and then like dip them down the road or whatever. Like, how do you incorporate these voices from below so they help create the policies, the million dollar question? But it's not beyond us. We're not stupid people. Like the left, you know, like the history may prove otherwise, but I think we're not stupid. And I think that we should have a redress of the party form and think through how we can do that. And I think at, I'm not arguing that that party form was the Labour Party. But what I am arguing is that the Labour Party, under Jeremy's leadership with John, presented itself as a vehicle upon which it could have been. And for a lot of people who were like up against the real radical end of the limit of like the politics of autonomy, this felt like something that could move and shape the whole of society. And so like, I think I'm ambivalent about whether we stay or go personally, but I think we need a big party. And I think it needs to be open at least to electoral coalitions. On that basis, before I get expelled from the Labour Party, then. <laughs> let me let me try and add to that. But I let me just go back to first principles. Um, and I don't want to sound economic determinist over this, but the reality is the, what's happening in the economy will shape this next period of struggle. And we need to we need to understand that, um, particularly because of the the immense potential suffering that is already occurring within our society as a result of what's happening as of you know, 12 years of austerity, for God's sake. Then on top of that, a cost of living crisis and the impact that COVID has had as well. So the reality is, I think what, what we're seeing and it's happening already is a reaction to those economic circumstances and it, it, it will build and I think it will build into forms of anger that has to be channeled. Otherwise, the right will challenge that anger. And that's exactly what Boris Johnson has done today. It is that he hasn't just introduced with Priti Patel these disgraceful, you know, you know appalling uh, nationality and immigration policies. So it isn't just to get him off the hook as a smoke screen for what's happened under Partygate. It is about recognizing that anger is building within our society against not just the Tories, but against the system itself. And therefore, they're going to target, as always, migrants. And it will be racist in its content throughout. And I think we've got to recognise that. So the right are already mobilising that anger. What we've got to do now is mobilise it ourselves and be alongside it. And that does mean recognising as well, and people don't mind me saying this, but it's true, under the Johnson regime, it is a proto-fascist state. If you look, what does proto-fascism mean? It means it's displaying all those characteristics that could lead you towards fascism. And I can't think of any other better example than citing what's happening in Parliament at the moment. The police and crime bill to ban demonstrations, the nationality to take people's citizenship away from them, the issues are around even the election registration, where for the first time in our history, a government will be interfering in the electoral commission that manages elections. Is it just extraordinary what's going through Parliament at the moment that really we've never seen before in this country in terms of this move towards conservative authoritarianism. So I think what we've got to do, and I was trying to jot down it as, as people are speaking, first of all, the most important thing, you support struggle. Every struggle that goes on, you, you support that industrial action. You support the climate change protesters. You, you support those people who are, will be campaigning again against the evictions that are taking place at the moment. That's the first thing. The second thing is you initiate struggle. If you see an issue, you bring people together, no matter how few, but you then start launching campaigns on those particular issues. And it's the point that other made is what you, and then you build those alliances. That's happening already. And, I, and that's what's so encouraging, really. The number of students that I've seen on the picket lines of UCU at colleges has been incredibly encouraging. But I've also seen on some of those picket lines as well, just members of the community joining them as well. Parents of students as well, it's quite remarkable. Third point, really, I just go back, I, I 
corporeal Marxism, but I mean, I believe you know, praxis is what we're about, the linking of theory and practice. And um, unless we do that, um, we'll go around the same old circles again. And so that does mean, it, that means we need to think through the forms of political education that we think could be most effective. Um, the World Transform has been, uh, have been mentioned, which I think a, was a fantastic initiative, an ongoing initiative. But we need a whole range of vehicles like that to enable political education to take place, but also political discussion. I remember when the World Transform ideas were formed. I went along to the first meetings where someone got up in one of the public meetings we had in the East End, and someone said, what is PPE? And I said, oh, it's a bloody degree people have, you know, politics, philosophy, and economics. And then someone jokingly, they said, well, what we need is people's political economics or whatever, and they went off and did it. And that's how the World, World Transform discussion started. And I, I just, again, what we've got to do, I think, is look at the mechanisms that are the best effective way of developing the political education, the political discussion that then will enable us to be confident that we have a body of cadres out there that will take us forward. Um, as for the political parties and, and the mechanism itself, we come back to the same old problem that we've got in our country, which is a first past the post system. If we had PR, we'd be in a different position altogether. But we've got a first past the post system. That's why the Labour Party realistically is the only, only vehicle. But I can understand that that will come. People will want to get involved in industrial struggles, social movement struggles and others. Eventually, we'll have to have a further discussion about the electoral politics of all of this. And that's when we'll have to have the debate again about the entry into the Labour Party of the new generation of those people who are genuinely interested in, in socialist struggle and socialist change. Final point for me in, in all of this is the thing about the In and Against the State book originally, it was based upon the very simple concept of solidarity in all its forms. And that's, I think, what we've got to display with a vengeance now in this, in this coming period and do so with, I think, absolute confidence. Yeah, we've been through some hard knocks in recent years. When haven't we? You know, uh, people kept on coming up to me after the 2019 election and said, look, well, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry. And I said, look, so am I, but look, usually when you try and have a, uh, engage in a socialist revolution, they round us up and put us in a football stadium. We've got away with that one this time. What we've got now is the next opportunity of come forward with the next wave exactly at the time when they think the left and the socialist progressive movements are suddenly down. I think they're not. I think they're coming back. Uh, and what we should do, and the point that Dilla has made, we've got to be completely non-sectarian about all of this. And also we've got to come at it with a bit of humility as well about learning new ideas and fresh initiatives and new strategies and tactics that can be used. So I'm incredibly buoyant and I'm really confident about what will happen in this next period. But it is about, like in the Against the State book originally, it was about learning the lessons of past struggles that will enhance our hope, the potential that we have for the future. And that's why I'm pleased with the um, republication of the book. And I, I, I'm genuinely, and I say this, uh, I say this, he'll be embarrassed about it, but actually the Seth's introduction is brilliant. It is a really good analysis of how we've got into this situation. Um, he just needs to do another bit now about the next steps on in a bit more detail. Thank you very much, John. I mean, this has been such an important and I mean, I guess it's been timely for a while, but especially now and somehow, obviously, we wouldn't have known that we, have, we couldn't have known that Pretty Patel and uh, Boris Johnson would have been announcing um, the next step in supposedly dealing with immigration. So it's been a really, really crucial conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, please read the book. Uh, if you sign up, if you become a member of the Left Book Club, you can always order any book from our backlist, including uh, In and Against the State. Um, and just before I start wrapping up, on the note of political education, for the Left Book Club, political education is a very crucial part of what we do. And particularly, and not limited to, but, but, but particularly through um, reading groups. So this year, we're trying to expand our network of reading groups. If you would like to start one, you don't actually have to be a member of the Left Book Club. Just email me, elif at leftbookclub.com, and um, 
we can support you in starting that. Let's get the discussions going. Let's get those discussions informing action and um, also building coalitions. So yeah, thank you very much for tuning in tonight. If you, like I said, if you would like to become a member of the Left Book Club, visit our website. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And of course, our conversations continue, particularly um, around the books that we publish. And this month's book is Climate Strike by Derek Wall. So we'll be having the event for that in May, on Tuesday, 10th May at 7 p.m. UK time. Um, it will be Derek Wall in conversation with uh, Amelia Womack of the Green Party and Professor Jody Dean. Go to leftbookclub.eventbrite.com to register for that. Um, and yeah, thank you for joining us tonight and hope you have a good evening or a good day wherever you are.